Welcome to Backcast 66, the podcast where we watch every single episode of the 1966 Batman television series and then chat about it for your entertainment. I'm Kendall. I'm Scott. And today we're talking about episode seven, Zelda the Great, written by Lorenzo Semple Jr., directed by Norman Foster, originally aired February 9th, 1966. Zelda the Great. It's the yeah. first villain uh, that I have no real history with. I think she's made up for the show. Has she ever worked her way into the DC Universe property, you know? If I remember correctly, she is in the comics based on this series, um, which is kind of cheating. Let's do a quick Google. I'm curious. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to do. However, typing Zelda the Great comes up with the show, which isn't super helpful. <laughs> Well, she doesn't have her own Wikipedia. Probably doesn't bode well. Yeah, it doesn't look like it. Yeah. All right. Yeah, no, Zelda the Great, she seems to be a uh, character that was invented for this series, which is uh, interesting because the episode they mentioned, like, this is her their first time tangling with Batman. So it makes me think, like, was the show originally intended to have continuity with the comics? Like, if you read the comics, like, you already met the Joker and the Riddler. So they don't like they're just like, oh, he's back, you know. Interesting. I mean, I don't think they thought that much into it, but that's kind yeah. of an interesting take, I think. I think that theory just falls apart because we knew that Mr. Freeze was someone Batman had fought before becoming Mr. Freeze. I mean, to be fair, I guess I don't know too much about Mr. Freeze in the comics from this era. Um, I just know he was like a thing that showed up like once or twice, maybe, but I don't know, just uh, something I thought about just now while we're talking about this. But yeah, I mean, that makes sense that a character created for this show, they would treat it as that character's first appearance. Yeah. And it's always, I mentioned in previous episodes, like it's neat not getting the origin for like the really well-known characters, but like, I'd kind of like to see some origin. So we kind of got that here. Yeah. All right. Well, should we dive right into it? Yeah, I guess there's no history. Like, we don't have a history with this character to talk about because this is her, you know, only time. Yeah. But, yeah. She, she might have shown up later in the series, but, uh, you know, it's not the Joker. Or, you know, like, she's not a classic Batman villain, you know? Well, I got a, uh, a quick spoiler in my search to see if she appeared in the comics. So she appears again but not in the way you might expect yeah i think i also got that spoiler so so we'll cross that bridge when we get there yeah all right so we start out on a quiet peaceful night in gotham city except at exactly 8 37 a.m at the first gotham national bank there's an explosion it kind of on screen looks like an earthquake, but no one mentions a quake. So I guess it's just an off screen explosion shaking the camera. Yeah, which is clearly they took a still frame and then like moved it around because uh, you can see like someone was walking by and like their shadow is just still against the building. Like they, they immediately stop walking and then it's the freeze frame and then they kind of just move it around. Ah, didn't catch that. Yeah, I like to look at like small like filmmaking details watching things cool and here we get a bank robbery Mm -hmm. someone wearing a gas mask maybe yeah uh is in the bank's vault just filling a bag of cash and a guard walks in on them the guard shouts for the thief to stop but then then just starts opens fire yeah just starts blasting the thief is wearing a bulletproof vest but That's got to be some bulletproof vest. They don't even flinch. Yeah, nothing happens. It's like they're (laughs) invincible. The the guard gets knocked out. And then, uh, of course, you know, they get away with with their loot that they were trying to get. Cut to police headquarters, and we find out that this is not the first time a robbery like this has happened. So every April 1st, for the past couple of years, exactly $100,000 has been stolen from a bank in Gotham City. The cops are totally clueless. 
And this time around, they feel like they need to call in the Batman. Yeah, and they mentioned that like they've been trying to solve this for years, and it's like one annual bank robbery. And it's like, this is a normal crime. And like the cops just can't handle it because they can't shoot somebody. They can't handle it. It's a little less than normal. But it's not like giant umbrellas and stuff. Nothing like that, but it's still a little sneaky. Mm -hmm. Chief O'Hara is just like, look, Commissioner, we need help. And then everyone in the room slowly turns and looks at the bat phone. Which is one of my favorite tropes from the show. I love it. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. And this is a, they also mentioned, they try reaching by the bat phone. And then they mentioned also turning on the bat signal, which I think is the first time we've They've mentioned the bat signal. Yeah, I'm pretty sure this is the debut of the bat signal. I was thinking about that too. And then at the end of the episode, like I realized during the credits of every episode, the bat signal is in the sky, like, you know, as a, as a cartoon. And I was like, oh yeah, I guess they have had the bat signal. They just haven't used it because they've got a Batman hotline, you know? Yeah. Well, it's a good thing they decided to uh, use the bat signal this time. I kind of wonder, are we supposed to infer that they always click on the bat signal just in case? I That's what I guess. It it would make sense if they, because they can't, you know, nobody is near the phone at Stately Wayne Manor. They're out stargazing. So nobody's there to pick up. And which would make sense of like, well, we can't reach him then use the backup thing with the bat signal. But I guess, you know, someone can run and turn it on. That's not a, it would make some sense. Also let the criminals know that Batman's going to be on the case. So I don't know, that's kind of cool. Yeah. So yeah, like we said, uh, no one's near the bat phone at Stately Wayne Manor. They're stargazing with a telescope out on the balcony. Dick is uh, excited because he can see the rings of Saturn, which, can you see the, the rings of Saturn with like a normal telescope? Um, I think if it was a clear enough night and you had a strong enough lens, you could. Because uh, yeah, we've known that Saturn's had rings since like Galileo times. Oh, okay. That makes sense then. Mm -hmm. They catch sight of the bat. Well, I guess it's Aunt Harriet who catches sight of the bat signal. Yeah, she comes up and tells them she's got, uh, what, roast ribs or something. Yeah. No time for roast ribs because Bruce all of a sudden remembers that it's Wednesday. Mm -hmm. And uh, he and Dick are meant to attend a lecture on South American politics. Yeah, because Dick says holy Venezuela. (laughs) Love that. (laughs) Nobody can piece together that Robin the Boy Wonder and Dick Grayson are the same character. And in this story, there's like ample opportunity for them to piece. piece Oh, I wanted to bring that up when we get there. So, yeah. (coughs) So using this uh, lecture as a cover... Bruce and Dick head to the bat poles and find themselves quickly at a police HQ. Yeah, uh, because, you know, that leads into the opening sequence for the show. So we get, you know, they change it. It's not guest villain. It's guest villainous and Baxter as Zelda the Great, Mm. Uh, which is strange because you could, I don't know, like it's just the everyone was so stuck in the gender binary at the time that you have to have it made me think about like why did we have so many like different gendered pronouns for like words that aren't act, like specifically related to gender i don't know it just it just got me thinking about that stuff you know yeah definitely <laughs> weird so at police hq the cops say they only have one clue and it's a, a slug that bounced off the bulletproof vest mm-hmm They're hoping they can find some fibers on it, but they haven't gotten anything from it now. So Batman takes it and the police and the dynamic duo discuss who could have robbed this bank? Who's doing this? Yeah. Why why April 1st? Because they're going to make April fools out of us. So uh, Chief O'Hare, this this part made me laugh out loud. Chief O'Hare is like, oh, maybe, you know, someone needs to pay their income tax because, you know, it's tax season. And then everyone gets real serious, like, no law-abiding taxpayer would rob a bank. That made me laugh so much. I don't know why. They're so serious, and it's such a ridiculous, like, thing to say, I think. (laughs) Batman has a plan to draw out the robber. Cut to the newspaper press, and 
Well, first he calls him on the phone and be like, newspaper, it's me, Batman. I have a story for you to run. And it's just like, there's like no checks and balances anywhere. Yeah, that is true. I just thought that was funny. Like, hi, it's me, Batman. I don't know. That made me laugh. Yeah, I mean, I guess they're just eager to help fight crime. Yeah. Uh, or as we find out, uh, Bruce Wayne is on the board to the newspaper, right? Oh, no, he's on the board to the bank. Yeah, so yeah, the newspaper is just like stoked to print a false story in order yeah, to... Yeah, to print a lie, print fake news. Yeah, uh, part of a dangerous trend. If only Batman could see you know, 60 years into the future. Yeah. Yeah, so the story is uh, that the money that was stolen was counterfeit in order to make the criminal strike again, you know, if they if they bought it. And we get, like, a newspaper boy slash man hawking the paper on the street corner. And it's kind of funny because there's a little fourth wall break where he, like, mentions, I forget exactly what it was, uh, it mentions the details in the thing to the camera. I thought that was funny. There's a couple fourth wall breaks, but yeah, yeah I uh, I did appreciate because a, a businessman passing by is just like, hey, what was what was counterfeit money doing at the bank? And the newspaper man is just like, I ain't no special news service. Buy the paper and find out. But then to sate his own curiosity, he he lets the viewer know. Yeah. Yeah. They're thinking of details in the show, you know. Yeah cut to the bat cave and batman and robin are analyzing the bullet they find traces of a, a chemical used in perfume oh yeah and they find it's got like a bunch of like silk garments that it hit so it must be a woman <laughs> yeah, of course that's how it works it's gotta be i mean the only cool thing about them that being able to deduce that it was a, a female criminal is they mentioned Catwoman. Who we haven't seen yet i'm like oh that's cool yeah it's our first mention of Catwoman. yeah i, know I really appreciate it for, yeah she doesn't show up for a while but it's like a nice world building because again she was like a regular in the comics um so if you were mildly from like you could have already have a knowledge of her as a kid or you see these out of order too you know yeah true that because i didn't watch these when they were new like i just like i already knew who Catwoman was Catwoman's already uh, up the river, as they said. That's their only female yeah. villain. So it has to be someone new. It's also mind-boggling that it's a woman. That's yeah. A crime. Even though in the very first episode, there was a female, female criminal. And in like a bunch of the stories. Yeah, know? there's always like a lady henchman. But they, it's guess, in guess, their minds. But I guess they were subservient to men. So that made sense in the natural order of things. Yeah, geez, this show... <laughs> This was the, it was the time. We move over to the Gnome Bookstore, which is ran by the strange Albanian genius, Aval Ekdal. So, yeah, uh, I have a friend from Albania. And while watching this episode, I texted her, like, the things that were happening. Like, how is this, a, is this a realistic to your experience at all? And obviously that's no. But they said they usually mention media as a uh, mock because I was like, hey, I was I wrote so I'm on the Zelda the Great episode of Batman 66. The villains are Albanian. And I'm pretty confident this is an accurate representation of your people. Uh, and she said in in media we're usually mafia, mafia, human traffickers, and jug lords slash dealers and or hitmen, so it's not too far off. Uh, well, I was like, Well, you're mad, you're criminal magicians this time. They're like, Oh yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm pretty sure this accent is not anything close to what the accent's supposed to be like. I'm sure not. Yeah. But uh, one interesting thing about Aval is, uh, according to the Handy Bat book, he actually is from the comics. Oh, is he? That's cool. Yeah. So we do get a comic book villain here. Just not who you would expect. Well, yeah, they seem to pull from the comics when, like, even when they need something smaller. Because one's in, like, the... Mel Hill gang from the first Riddler episode, like a minor comic book thing too. But yeah, they came they from a like, Riddler yeah. story. Did they come from a Riddler story? I couldn't remember if they were divorced from the Riddler initially or not. So in the episode, they were working with the Riddler. In the story, they were antagonistic to the Riddler. That's what it was. Okay. Yeah. Well, like it's still cool. I didn't see, I didn't know that. 
Yeah. I love that bat book. I got to get you your copy. Every time yeah. I see you, I forget to bring it along. Yeah, it's fine. So it's here we learn that uh, Aval is the one putting Zelda, who was the bank robber, uh, up to these annual robberies. Aval is a designer of magician equipment. Yeah, and she's like a, a magician escape artist. Yeah, so he demands a, a yearly sum of $100,000 from her. And Zelda says all she ever wanted was to be a poor, honest magician. And uh, she's crying here. Mm -hmm. But Aval quickly deduces that those are just uh, crocodile glycerin tears. Yeah, it's a stage trick because she keeps rubbing her eyes because that's how they would do that. They would hide it in their hand like the way she does. Uh, but it was pretty funny because this show, as sexist as it is, usually portrays the, the female villains as not as evil as the male counterparts. Uh, so this kind of leans into that expectation and then does a, a quick turn. Yeah, I kind of like it more if she's just a bad guy. Yeah. Like, she wants to be the best. She wants to have the best, yeah. you know, traps to escape. And she's willing to rob a bank to get it. Oh, yeah, but yeah, the, uh, Aval's uh, reading the newspaper and, like, looking at the money. And it's the fakest money I've ever seen. <laughs> like it looks like monopoly money he's like ah oh, this is counterfeit how could it be and like look at it i don't think i don't think that story is a lie <laughs> well in the world of batman yeah the story is a lie that money is as real as can be so abel has designed an inescapable doom trap as he calls it mm -hmm. Um, it's made out of uh, jet age plastic, uh, which is just a bulletproof plastic, I guess. Uh, yeah, and, like something. Yeah. Deadly gas comes up from the bottom. Oh, no, uh, deadly colored gas. Yes. So, because that way we can see it, because he mentions it again. Uh, and it has a trap door at the bottom, but it is electrified. So Zelda. Well, while, while they're explaining this thing, I'm like, I bet Batman is going to get into this trap. Like, well, of it, course. Yeah. Well, then they've mentioned it quickly. Like, oh, yeah, we want Batman to go into this. I was like, oh, OK. <laughs> they're not even trying to like, subvert your expectations on that. Yeah, well, you know, it's uh, Chekhov's inescapable doom trap. Exactly. Zelda wants to know how you get out. And Aval says, if you bring me $100,000, I'll tell you. Mm -hmm. So Zelda's back on the hunt for more money. Uh, also in the paper is uh, an article about the star of Samarkand. And Zelda figures she could steal this jewel and use that as payment, which Abel is totally okay with, uh, even though he mentions it's more difficult than, yeah, of course. than money. But uh, Zelda... Zelda's pretty smart. Yeah. She's like, this is a little too convenient here. Mm -hmm. Obviously a setup. She's going to steal the jewel just in case, but she's going into it with the expectation that it's a trap. Yeah. I, I think she's got probably the best villain plan we've seen thus far on the show. Yeah. You know, all the other crooks seem to just like be causing chaos for the hell of it. Yeah. And this, while initially it does feel like chaos, she she's working multiple angles here. Yeah. 
I, I really dig it. Um, because yeah, because then we cut to the jewelry store, I guess, where it is. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Stonewind's Jewelers or something like that. Yeah. Um, and Batman is laying out his trap where they've replaced the emerald with a false emerald that has a tracking device in it. And he and Robin are going to hide and try to snatch the, the, the criminal. Um, but even if they can't get them, that, that they'll be able to track them with the emerald. Yes. So further feed into this episode's sexism, Miss Stonewall, who owns the, the business, is just like drooling over Batman. Like she's she's hot for Batman. Yeah, ladies cannot resist a man in uniform. Definitely not, especially not Batman. And this is one of the similarities between Lorenzo Semple Jr.'s previous episode. Mm -hmm. Uh, He wrote the Penguin story. Yeah. That had the the movie star who had never heard of Batman, but just became immediately infatuated. There's another similarity, and we'll get to that later uh, mm-hmm. but perhaps you intelligent viewers can or listeners rather excuse me can uh, can figure that out already zelda is watching batman and robin set their trap up because honestly they're doing it in broad daylight yeah she's watching from like across the street with binoculars yeah she kind of breaks the fourth wall here yeah, she basically explains their plan and, like, kind of looks at the audience. Yeah, she, like, turns to the camera and lets us know she's got the leg up on Batman and Robin. Yeah, because otherwise she's just talking to herself. No one else is there in the universe. Yeah. Meanwhile, back at Stately Wayne Manor, Aunt Harriet gets a phone call. Poor Dick got hurt on the playground. Yeah, how old is he supposed to be? Yeah, for real. <laughs> I get that Aunt Harriet is an overprotective busybody. And, you know, maybe if uh, one of your siblings and their spouse got murdered at a circus and left their son to be in your care, maybe maybe we'd all be overprotective like that. But yeah. Sounds like Dick just got hit in the head with a ball or something. Yeah. Anyway, the person on the other line says they're sending a taxi to to scoop her up. Us viewers know that Dick Grayson is running around in green underpants trying to solve this bank robbing mystery. So we know something's up. Meanwhile, back at the jewelry store, an old lady dressed like she just came from a funeral comes hobbling in. Yeah, meanwhile, there's a bunch of ladies just inches away from this thing, just fawning over it. Like, yeah. That's the way they put their jewels on display. They're expecting them to get robbed. Maybe this whole operation that this lady has is like an insurance scam. <laughs> Maybe. Why would you do that in Gotham City? Yeah. And advertise in the newspaper that you have this thing. Yeah, well, you know, people make a lot of dumb advertisements in the newspaper. Remember when they specifically called out the Joker? Oh, yeah. They're like, yeah, we're not having that guy in our in our museum. Anyway, Batman quickly deduces that this old lady is the thief, which is kind of messed up. Just automatically, ju- I mean, this lady looks very conspicuous. But and she's drawing a lot of attention to herself. The old lady examines the emerald and then immediately releases a poison gas yeah everyone starts choking and when the glass clears the lady is gone and zelda the great is there in all of her orange glory batman goes to apprehend her and she disappears uh but what was cool about this is batman does the bat like bat shadow with his cape which is something you only associate with like the serious takes on batman like intimidating criminals I thought it was really cool to see it here. It was pretty cool. He deduces that the mirrors in her headdress or... Uh, she had, like, jewels in her hat. Like, yeah, she he deduces this was an optical illusion. It was very Scooby-Doo. Like, <laughs> quite was, oh, he had a flashlight and a matchstick. That's how he made this ghost appear. Yeah. 
this creates like a little bit of a <laughs> continuity issue later on. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, maybe just keep in mind that Batman has seen this woman and knows that she used an optical illusion to escape from him. Let's say after this, you know, or actually when they're showing the sting, uh, Batman was explaining the sting. They showed how they're hiding the Batmobile with some cops across the street. Because as soon as this lady gets out, you know, they try to chase her. Uh, they get a call on the phone in the Batmobile saying while all of this was going down, they got a ransom note for Harriet Cooper, uh, for Bruce Wayne, they need to get a hold of Bruce Wayne to pay this ransom, which I thought was a pretty good, clever way for them to try her to try to like an alternate way for her to try to get the money. There is a resident millionaire, you know. Yeah. You, I, you know, I thought I originally thought maybe she would rob them while they were like Batman and Robin were going to be distracted by this other thing that they're doing. Um, obviously, not knowing that. Bruce Wayne and those guys would not have been home regardless. But, you know, kidnapping Aunt Harriet makes sense. How, how did Zelda know that Dick Grayson wasn't at home? I don't think she did. Or maybe it's like the middle of the day on a school day. Um, but then Dick Grayson would be at school. No, he could still get still have gotten injured. But, but Dick Grayson isn't at school. You know what I mean? There's no, no I way Batman is taking Dick Grayson out of school. Of course. But I don't know. She tried something. I feel like she just really lucked out that like she didn't call Aunt Harriet saying Dick was injured and then Dick is just in the other room practicing French or Italian or... Or maybe she just she's lied saying. depending on who picked up. But then again, I don't know if Star 69 was a thing then because she could have just hung up. And then tried calling again later with some other lie. That's true. That's true. Yeah. You know, I just think Aunt Harriet would probably have fallen for anything. Yeah. But yeah, according to the tracker on the Batmobile, the fake star of Samarkand is just in a nearby garbage can. Yeah, she just threw it on the ground. Batman's like, ah, this criminal knew what we were up to and is just fooling with us. They get the call. Uh, Harriet Cooper's been kidnapped and Robin's just like, oh no, not Aunt Harriet. I mean, not Harriet Cooper. Yeah, right in front of the cops. Right in front of the cops. So yeah, I mean, we know that the cops are kind of kind of dumb in this world, uh, but this was a huge oversight on their part. So yeah, we cut to Zelda's hideout and... She just has a, a vat of oil on fire in her living room. Yeah. Like a like a small swimming, like bigger than a kiddie pool, but like... Dude, it was like a big tub of fire. Yeah. They say it's oil in the uh, second episode. Yeah, but like we don't know that yet. So it just looks like she's got a huge circus tub of fire. Yeah, and if you can imagine, poor Aunt Harriet is just suspended over this fire in a straight jacket with her face covered i i don't know i don't know if her old heart could take it you know what i mean it's interesting that the cliffhanger is not batman or robin in trouble this time that's true this is the first time where it's a, a third party mm -hmm. but yeah like you said it's the cliffhanger can they save aunt harriet i uh, i guess i hope so but I mean, I don't want an old lady to die, but yeah, I think uh, regular listeners know we don't really care for Aunt Harriet. It's not anything inherently bad about the character. It's just you know, she brings nothing. She to brings the nothing to the table, other than like I guess to be a damsel in distress now. Yeah. Well. I don't know. What, what did you think of this uh, first intro to this new villain? Um, I didn't think it was that bad. Yeah. I, uh, I was pleasantly surprised. I kind of liked it. I was a little worried last week. Yeah, so was I. I was we like, had oh. some pretty big highs we were coming off of. Yeah, and, you know, Mr. Freeze was a bit lower than the rest. 
Uh, and I, I thought this was going to be worse than that, but I like this episode. Yeah. I guess y'all can join us next week and find out the uh, the fate of Aunt Harriet. Yes, yeah, same backcast time, same backcast channel. Take care, y'all.